doctoral use of the haematology registrar in north central London, currently working at UCLH. She studied medicine at Queen's Cambridge Intercald in Immunology and graduated with distinction and a Queen's Foundation Scholarship for Excellence in the final exams. She completed foundation training at UCLH and core medical training out at the Hammersmith and her interest in sickle cell and transfusion started whilst doing a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene at the Kilimanjaro Christian Medical Center in Moshi, Tanzania and Malaga Hospital in Kampala in Uganda. And this interest has continued through her work with the red cell team at North Middlesex Hospital last year, where she's presented work on hyperhemolysis and done an audit on fetal deep genotyping at the British Blood Transfusion Society annual conference. And in her spare time, like the best of us, she enjoys cycle touring and she sings in a local choir. We're going to hear about RH variants and tricky transfusions. It's going to be a case presentation. And we're, going to, we're also going to hear from Laura in this talk as well. Now, Tracy, before I start, before I let you in, Dr. Rose, shall I, shall I give Laura's bio as well, do you think, or should we just, as we're going to, how are we going to do the talk? I would give Laura's as well, because we're sort of with um, mixing and matching a bit. Yeah. I'm glad. So Laura Eastwood, is, she's, a, she's a biomedical scientist and senior BMS in transfusion in hospitals in the Northwest, where she's worked for nearly 13 years. She moved to work at RCI in Leeds as a senior BMS before starting the Higher Specialist Scientist Training Programme as a trainee consultant clinical scientist. She's currently working on a doctoral research project which aims to look at the effectiveness of virtual reality for training BMSs to perform cross matches. She's looking for junior staff in transfusion labs to take part. So if your lab is interested, please get in touch with her for more information. So over to you two. Thank you very much for your talk. Okay. Hi everyone, thanks for that introduction. Um, so I'm going to start with a case presentation on um, a patient with RH variants who was tricky to transfuse and then Laura's going to um, take over for a bit and talk about what happened in the NHS BT, BT side of things. Um, so, so our case starts in um, December 2022 um, where we have a 37 year old um, patient with sickle cell anemia who presented to UCLH with flu like symptoms. So she's got a background of HBSS sickle cell and at baseline she's got a haemoglobin of about 80 and a fetal haemoglobin of about 7% and she normally runs with slightly low oxygen saturations of about 92% on air. She's not on disease modifying treatment, so she's not on hydroxycarbamide. This is due to patient choice, despite um, lots of discussions about this in clinic. And she's also not on a regular transfusion program. And um, it transpires in the history that she's got a history of delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. So just to sidestep and go into a bit more detail about her transfusion history. So she's been transfused on a couple of occasions previously, um, once in Kent in 2000 when she had a sickle crisis and had a four unit top up transfusion. And then again in July 2021 um, at the North Middlesex Hospital when she got COVID, unfortunately, and had a chest crisis subsequent to that and had an emergency red cell exchange. Now, this was significant because a few weeks later she presented back to the North Middlesex. I was actually a registrar there at the time um, where she had delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction with an um, anti HRB antibody detected. She was um, really unwell, actually. Her hemoglobin dropped to 49 um, and um, she required sort of um, ITU management. Um, with a little bit of digging, it transpired that she'd actually had this anti-HRB that was also identified in Kent back in 2000 following her previous transfusion. Um, so uh, I still remember this really well. I was on the wards at the time and she um, was super unwell in August with her really low haemoglobin. And after much umming and ahhing, she had a three unit top up transfusion with frozen units um, with IVIG and IV methyl pred cover. And she was transferred to UCLH where she was monitored in their ITU, and thankfully made a full recovery and didn't require any further units at that time. So this is all in her background. And um, let's fast forward again to December 2022 when she's come into UCH again with these flu like symptoms. So she comes in, she's got a fever and a cough and she tests positive for flu A. Her SATs are quite a way behind but below her baseline. She's got oxygen saturations of 85% on air and she's requiring four litres of oxygen um, to saturate 96%. Her bloods are not particularly remarkable at this stage. Her haemoglobin is 70, so a bit below her baseline. The rest of the bloods are not particularly remarkable and her CRP is only two. And her chest X-ray is fairly unremarkable as well. However, 
obviously everyone is quite concerned, particularly given her history and her high oxygen requirement. Um, the, we know that it's going to be really, really difficult to transfuse her um, given the issue she had the year before. So she's covered with Tamiflu and antibiotics and she's transferred to the intensive care at UCH to have high flow oxygen, um, doing anything we can to try and avoid her needing a transfusion. But understanding that she'll probably end up, she may well end up needing one, a discussion's had with, at this point with NHSBT and um, several group and screens are sent. She's got um, an anti-HRB detected again and she's also got an anti-Big E at this point. Her haemoglobin is starting to drop. She started on erythropoietin, 20,000 units daily. Um, she's also given folate and her iron and B12 are checked. And in anticipation of the fact that she might need transfusion, she's given methylpred and IVIG. Unfortunately, she does, over the following week, she does start to deteriorate. Her oxygen requirement goes up, so she's on 60% FiO2, so really high um, oxygen requirement in the intensive care. And she's in absolute agony. She's on a clonidine infusion and ketamine infusion in the ITU, so re really in lots of pain. Um, unfortunately, her haemoglobin is now starting to drop um, further, and it goes down to 47 um, in early January. With this, she's got new consolidation on her chest X-ray that you can see there, and her CRP has jumped right up, so um, a marker of infection. She's escalated to really broad spectrum antibiotics, but things are really not going in the right direction at this point. And hopefully you can see here, this is just a graph showing what her haemoglobin is doing. So it starts off in the about 70 when she first comes in, but over the new year it drops and drops and drops and reaches, is in the 40s by early January. So what do we do next? <laughs> do we transfuse and how do we find blood? Um, so Laura's going to take over for a bit here and talk about what happened on the lab side. Thanks, Hannah. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did within NHSPT and then I'll hand back over to Hannah for the, um, the patient outcomes. So to start with, just before we delve into the the details of this case. I'm just going to do a basic background of RH and RH variants as well because it can be quite a complex topic. So to start off, the RH system was one of the first systems that were identified when um, blood groups were starting to be identified. Um, it was discovered by injecting rabbits and guinea pigs with red cells from rhesus macaque monkeys. So that's where the name rhesus came. It was later found out that the antibodies in here that they found were actually anti-species um, antibodies, not the antibody that we know today, but the name rhesus had already stuck. Um, but as we said, rhesus is a monkey, not a blood group system, so it's uh, referred to now as RH. And it is one of the most complex blood group systems that we have. There's 56 antigens in this blood group system. But on a day-to-day -day basis, we refer to the ones that are shown here, D, big C and little c and big E and little e. Now how do we inherit the RH um, antigens? So you have two sets of genes, you have your RHD gene and your RHCE gene and they're found on chromosome one and you inherit two copies. So you can see here we've got uh, a mother who is R1, so that's big C, D, little e, she's R1, R1 and she passes on one of those um, genes to her child. And then we've got the father here is R2. So that's little c, d, big E, and little r, which is c, d, e. So either of those genes can be passed on to the, uh, the child. So we have a child here who is R1, R2. Um, so the genes themselves, they are very similar. There's 94% sequence identity. So that means that we get a lot of crossing over between the genes. And that's one of the reasons why we can end up with RH variants. So they're more common than what we think they are. Evidence shows that one in five sickle cell patients will have an RH variant. Um, I'm sure we've come across already D variants. They're the ones that are most commonly talked about um, day to day, but we can potentially get them in any antigen. So uh, we most commonly hear about them in little e and big C antigens as well. So if you have an RH variant and you are transfused with blood that is a standard RH antigen, you can create an antibody against the part that you're missing or the RH variant. 
not all antibodies associated with RH variants are clinically significant. So it's it's by a case by case basis, antibody basis, we're looking at them and seeing um, what kind of blood we need to select. So with D variants, um, if we get an allo anti D, so if a D um, a D variant individual is transfused with D positive blood and they create an antibody against what they uh, the part that they're missing, that's an allo anti D, and we do consider that clinically significant. However, as an example, if you have a little e variant and you create an anti little e like antibody, which is a bit of a mouthful, um, they're not usually classed as clinically significant. But as this case highlights, that's not always the case. So how do we test for RH variants? Well, um, if you've seen the cards here, these are the RH cards that are used routinely in labs. They um, detect so they detect the phenotype, RH phenotype, but they're not usually very good for detecting RH variants. And also in this particular population, um, sickle cell populations, they're generally transfused, so you're not going to get accurate results. So the next um, method that we should use that is more reliable is the HGP genotype. Now, this genotype is different to um, standard genotyping. It uses um, Sanger sequencing, so it's more likely to be able to detect the, the variants that um, we're seeing more and more. So going back to this case study, it's a good case study because it does demonstrate the antibodies that you can form in RH variants, um, the serology testing that we do in the lab to identify what these antibodies are, and it goes through as well what what the choices are for providing blood in this situation. So just to cover again um, what Hannah said before, so we've got a 37 year old sickle cell patient and we already know her group and phenotype. So she's group O negative. She has a big C variant and a little E variant and she's known to have anti HRB. So what is anti HRB? Um, well, it's it's important to remember as well, this, with transfusion, you can have slightly different nomenclature and it makes something completely different. So an anti-capital HRB is a different antibody um, altogether, which I won't cover today, but that is classed as clinically significant. So anti-HRB in this one that we're talking about is an anti little e like antibody. So in our panels, in our antibody panels, it looks like an anti little e but it's not your standard anti little e so it's not usually considered clinically significant. And HRB is a high frequency antigen, so 98% of our population are positive. And if we're looking for HRB negative units, we need the individuals that are literally negative. So R2, R2, or R dash, R double dash, R double dash, which again is very rare blood. So as anti-HRB is not generally considered clinically significant, how do we incorporate that into our unit selection? So first of all, the, the priority is to avoid these patients making an anti-biggie because that's well documented that it is clinically significant. So we would select units that are literally negative, sorry, biggie negative, literally positive, so that we're avoiding that um, that scenario. But in this case, the patient had a reported transfusion reaction to HRB. So it's in this case, we do need to consider it clinically significant. So um, a search was done for um, R double dash, R double dash units. Um, the less than 0.1% of the general population of this phenotype, so you can imagine it's very difficult to find these type of units. Um, however, on this occasion, there were three wet units. So those are units that are in general stock. But there was a patient at the same time that had anti-D anti, and anti-Big E, so um, those units had to be prioritised for that patient. There are a small number of frozen units, but as Hannah mentioned as well, the patient had already made an anti-Big E, so do we want to be giving units that are Big E positive, little E negative? So we hadn't tested a sample at the reference lab for quite a while, so another sample was requested just to see if that might help inform our blood selection. So you can see here, I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to make everyone interpret the panels, I'll point out on here what's, um, what's important. So we've got an antibiggy that you can see here that's reacting by IAT. And then the weaker antibody here, we've got pan-reactivity, which is possibly due to the anti-HRB. 
So bearing that in mind, we've got a stronger reacting anti-Big E and a weaker reacting anti-HRB. So how do we make the decision on what blood to select? So as we said, we would normally select Big E neg little E positive because HRB is not normally clinically significant, but this patient had had a transfusion reaction. So ideally, we'd want to select big E negative, little E negative units to avoid both of both of them. But that's unfortunately, that's not an option for us. So as the anti big E was currently reacting stronger than the anti HRB, the decision was to make uh, the decision was made to provide O little R little R units. So these are D neg, big E neg, little E pos. So they are HRB pos. Um, and of course, because we'll be providing antigen positive units for a patient that is known to have a transfusion reaction, it was advised to provide IVIG and steroid cover. So Hannah, I'll hand back to you. Thank you so much, Laura. So um, back to our case. So as we said, we had this discussion with NHSBT and it was it was um, difficult but the conclusion was we were going to transfuse the O little r little r units um, with IVIG and methyl preds cover and monitor closely for hemolysis so this is what we did so she had a unit on the 1st of January at which point her haemoglobin had been 47 and initially things went pretty well and her haemoglobin incremented nicely and she clinically got better so her fevers went away and she was not needing as much oxygen so a, a real improvement and um, improved to the extent that she actually managed to step down um, from intensive care to the ward after a week after she had this transfusion. Unfortunately things didn't continue um, to go quite so well um, so as she, after she stepped down to the ward you can hopefully see here um, the first dip in the haemoglobin is um, was the point where she was transfused. She initially has a good response, but then her haemoglobin starts to drift down again. She also clinically starts to deteriorate again. So she's still on oxygen, her fevers come back and her pain is getting worse as well. And haemoglobin drifts back down into the 50s. So a decision is made a week or so later on the 15th of January where that first arrow is, she has a second unit of blood. Um, again, O little r, little r, Kelneg. This doesn't do so much. Um, didn't I think she didn't actually have this unit with um, IVIG cover, um, uh, possibly an error. So um, she didn't really increment so well and um, didn't make much clinical improvement. So she had another unit of blood on the 18th of January um, with IVIG cover this time because the haemoglobin was still really low. It'd gone back to 47. Her bilirubin, you can see, has also been going up and down at the top here um, around around the times of transfusion. Um, but after the second unit, luckily, she, things stabilised out a little bit. So although her haemoglobin didn't increment particularly well, it stayed in the 50s. She gradually started to get better and thankfully didn't need another transfusion. And you can see here what her haemoglobin in pink and her reticulocyte count in purple and then her bilirubin in green have done over this time. So going up and down, but at the point of these arrows where she's transfused, you can see after the last arrow on the 18th of January, things slowly, slowly, slowly start to get better. She doesn't need any more transfusions. And finally, but, um, on the 5th of February, so six weeks after she's first come into hospital, she um, gets discharged with a haemoglobin of 74 and her bilirubin is 19. So she's not haemolyzing at this point. So I spoke to her in clinic a month or so later. She was doing really well. Um, unfortunately, still um, adamant that she did not want to go on to hydroxycarbamide, unfortunately. So that's an ongoing discussion, but thankfully doing much better. And we'll just cross our fingers that she doesn't need another transfusion anytime soon.